Starting in verse 1, just read a few this morning. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. And we'll stop there. Another powerful prophecy. Israel, at this time, was in need of a, they were in desperate need of a righteous king. They were in need of an uncorrupted leader. Also, the time of judgment was coming for the nation. And through this prophet, Micah, these words are coming to bring a hope 750-ish years before Jesus is born. Micah was written, if you look at the history, probably a section in the beginning of your chapter, you had him writing during the period of three kings, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Now, two of them were okay, pretty good. One of them, of course, was evil. But something they all had in common as leaders, as rulers of nations, was that they struggled with pride. Now, all of us struggle with it. It's a human thing. But especially leaders with pride responsibility and, 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 and power. All rulers, all presidents, all kings, all whatever the position is, CEOs, managers, and all the kings of the Old Testament struggled with pride except for one, and that is who we're talking about today, and that is a righteous king, Jesus Christ. He was born in a little place, Bethlehem. Sounds special to us because we're Christians and we're like, yeah, it's Bethlehem. Special, right? But in reality, it's a, it was a lowly place. The population is much higher now, but I think actually it's, it's closer to Spencer's population. But at the time... This was a small, insignificant village about five miles out of Jerusalem, probably about the size of Everly. Have you ever been to Everly? Anybody? How many of you are from Everly? You're, wow, you're from Everly? Cool. Um, I love Everly just because some of you live there. In fact, that's the first... Everly's kind of part of my calling because when I came to visit the Stanleys, I saw that Everly water tower and I thought that was Spencer somehow in my mind. I'm like, what is this place? And I I mean, I love Everly, but it's a lowly place. Bethlehem, around the same at that time population of Everly. And if you live in Everly, you know it's lowly, right? I mean, no offense, but you don't even have a Walmart. (laughs) You got, here's what you got. You got the quick spot and the ranch. What else do you have? That's about it. And do they even deliver pizzas there? They do? I don't know. Oh, the ranch delivers pizzas. There you go. Um, So small place, lowly place. Why would God choose a little village like Bethlehem to send the ruler of all creation? Well, the Bible gives us a clue in 1 Corinthians 1.27. It says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. 
God chose the humble way. Jesus Christ entered the world in humility. Born into an oppressed nation, tiny village, lower class family, lower working class family. But let's, let's go deeper than that this morning. Let's, let's think deeper than that because Jesus entered the humiliation of becoming a child, an infant. That's, that's God himself, Jesus, in the darkened womb of his own creation. Now, we can't comprehend this, but I'll try to take a little, a little journey of that narrative. If it were possible for me to return to my mother's womb this morning, before my first thought, how about before my first heartbeat? Would I do it? Would you do it if it were possible for you to return to your mother's womb and... Um, Lose all that you've lived for so far, your self-sufficiency, to become utterly dependent on the life, the, the breath, the, the blood, the biology of your mother. That's what you become dependent on. Would you go back? I don't think I could do it. That's, that's, I've never thought about that before. That's hard. And this was not a mere human being like us. This was God made flesh. Who had never been a baby before. He left the throne room for a womb. A dark womb. So he did the unthinkable. And he did it in humility. Somebody get me a water bottle, please. I just don't want to distract you with this bottle anymore. Um, Jesus came into this darkened place, going through the process of being formed, all the things that we go through as, as uh, human beings, of course not conceived by the Holy Spirit, but still, and he came for a reason, and the reason was not to belittle us, to demean us, to force his way on us, and that's the whole reason he's coming to such a little place, a little town, in such a little way, because Jesus, he actually came to serve us. Jesus came to serve us. Matthew twenty twenty eight. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So the incarnation, what we're focusing on during Christmas, the incarnation equals humility. It is humility. It is the antitype to pride. The way Jesus came to earth, it actually the way that he did it holds the secret for everything else in your life. It is, if you'll get this today, it is, thank you so much. It is the key to everything. It comes before gratitude and thankfulness. Because you cannot even be thankful and come into his courts without humility. Humility. It's the key to deliverance. It is the key to blessing, abundance, holiness, redemption, peace. All of these things. Because if, and glory, if pride is the root of sin, which it is, humility is the root of redemption. And this is what Jesus came to show us. Jesus coming to earth, his coming down to earth is directly opposed to how Satan fell to earth. 
Let's, let's look at scripture for this. Isaiah 14, 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. So Satan fell to earth because of pride. Which is the most demonic of the, what they call seven deadly sins. In actuality, it is the root of all of those deadly sins. In the garden, Satan tempted Adam and Eve with pride, from pride, because of his pride. And they fell, and they, they really forsook what they already had in the garden, and what they had was perfect humility. And by that I mean submission to the Father completely. Perfect submission to the, total dependence. No competition. They lost their dependence on God. They lost their humility. And then after that, we see what happens. Pride just continues to grow. And we see the root causing all the bad things in our world. Pride is why people fail us. Pride is why we fail other people. Pride is the reason married couples fight. We know that. Married couples. It's why we hurt each other. Pride causes people to cheat, steal, even lust. We can associate it and trace it back to this root. And it's because we've come to think that our way is somehow higher than God's. Especially in our churches. And, and, and here's where it's going to hit home, and just, just, just stay, stay tuned. Stay till the end. Pride in the church, in the body of Christ, it prevents breakthrough. Pride elevates religion over relationship. Pride keeps people divided and bitter. Pride makes us critical. Pride makes us competitive with each other. Pride makes us have the feeling we are holier than thou. Pride draws attention to us. Pride produces social clubs in cliques instead of ministries. Pride breeds false doctrine and it refuses to change. Pride makes us feel comfortable right where we're at. Pride demands control of what we call our ministries. Pride makes people look down on the pastor, and pride makes the pastor look down on the people. When we're all called to be humble servants, pride will inevitably cause this message to offend us, which only reveals how subtle the pull is in us, in our fallen nature. The pull of pride. So Micah prophesies a humble child from a little town to bring prideful human beings hope by teaching us the real key to glory the real pathway to peace, and ultimately the, the, the door to heaven that we all want. It's humility that really teaches us what is good. And Micah says a few chapters on, if, if you've read Micah 6, 8, I'll read it in the Amplified. Famous verse, a lot of us know it. I have it on my wall in my office. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you except to be just and to love and to diligently practice kindness, compassion, and to walk humbly 
with your God, setting aside any overblown sense of importance or self-righteousness. Didn't Jesus teach us this? This is Jesus. He taught us what is good. He set aside. He had every rightful sense of importance. He's Jesus. He empties himself to the state of an embryo, something we can't even imagine. So because of that, we're going to start with his birth, and that's number one. Philippians 2.6. who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with, with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. That took a lot of emptying that we don't know about because we're not God. But Jesus did not have to be born into flesh. To exist, he's already existed from eternity's past, obviously. He chose to. And he was born in a humble way, actually in humility, which is, is God's character. And he was born without sin. So for us, we are all born into pride and we are all born into sin. Jesus was born once and he never changed. Human beings, we, we have to be born again. And we have to change. John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Reborn in his humble nature, not prideful nature, because there is no such thing when it comes to God. We have to be born again, humbly. And of course, it's, if, if he, we know this, it, it's his doing anyway, so we can't even boast. And the scripture proves that, and here's the humility there. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So there's this continual, if you're, if you're seeing it, it's, it's, it's woven all throughout the Bible. We cannot be born again or we cannot be saved in pride or because, I don't know, you just want to be better, right? You want to be a better person? You ever, have you ever done that? You've done the fake Christian thing? Anybody? Come on. I was baptized once when I was in the Air Force and I had no idea what I was doing. I just went to a Baptist church and I ran up and I said, yeah, baptize me. Why did I do it? I thought it would make me a better person. Was I really saved? No, I was not. Because the root of it was pride. We must have a desperation for the Savior to come to him. Realizing that we can do nothing without him or for him because we are nothing without him. So without humility, without submission to God, obviously there can't be salvation. There can be an intellectual knowledge of the Bible. And perhaps you have an assent, a mental acknowledgement that you would want to call faith, but it's really the faith of the Pharisees because our religion of pride is no religion at all, not a pure one anyway. So the humble birth of Jesus Christ at the first Christmas shows us how to be born again. It shows us how to enter into this new life that we have in him. It's how to enter into his life, and we have to do it humbly. And we must stay lowly. It doesn't just happen once where we're desperate at salvation and we say the sinner's prayer and then, okay, well, we're good now. No, we continue. And that's what Jesus showed us because he grew up, even went through puberty. That's humbling enough. <laughs> Whew. Pray for me. I have a teenage daughter. Jesus humbled himself in his life. That's number two. Jesus lived humble. And he taught us right from the start how to live 
countercultural to what is our culture now. And we have a culture and a world system built on the pride of man, don't we? This world still teaches us that the less are lesser and the greatest are greater. Jesus lived out his life to serve people in a new and radical way. And that's why this is such a radical lifestyle for us. Luke twenty two twenty five, And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. This is what Jesus said. Jesus, the Son of God, God manifested in the flesh, took the place of a servant, a servile position? What does that mean? Well, to start, this is going to be a big issue for you if you do not believe in the Trinity. And then we'll go into it. Because when Jesus did this, how he lived his life while he was on earth, it, humility means total, entire subordination to God. So let me prove it with scripture and we'll consider the verses and, and you just take in the, the humility of this because it's incredible. And I saw this and I was just in awe. Here's Jesus, what he did instead of doing what the world does, doing what, what we do. He said, instead of saying it's all about me, Jesus said, he said, he can do nothing of himself, John 5, 19. Instead of saying, I have to have my way, Jesus said, he does not even seek his own will. John 5.30. Instead of seeking approval, he said he desired none from man. John 5.41. Instead of, instead of taking credit for his own teaching. Okay, this is Jesus. Taking credit for his own ministry. He said his teaching wasn't even his. John 7, 16. And this is Jesus. He said, I don't seek my own glory in John 8, 50. So do you see the humility? It's the heart of God. And is that our heart? Is that our heart when we demand our own way? Is that our heart when we, when we, uh, and American Christians, okay, and Eric, you're, I think you're an American, right, technically? I mean, so, I mean, if you, if you didn't come from America, but um, we American Christians, is that what we do when we, when we seek our own will, and then here's the excuse we use, right? I'm just a strong-willed person. I just, I'm just strong-willed, that's how my, no, no, no. Is that, are we acting humbly? Is that what we do in ministry when we act like these ministries are ours? Like this is, this is my pulpit or this is my church or this is your sound booth or your row or your seat or your, you fill in the blank, right? When we seek our own glory or that is this what we do as Jesus did when we seek our own glory and the approval of other people becomes the fulfillment to make us whole? To make us feel complete? All of those things, ladies and gentlemen, the, the root of them, the root of why we crave those things and why we seek after those things, it's pride and they're not even from, from the Father. 
They're of the world. 1 John 2.16 talks all about it. And they're dying. They're dying. The old Adam nature will pass away. It's going to die. We are called to what never fades, and that's the nature of Christ. And that was born in Bethlehem, in a little place. Really, it's, it's the incarnation of humility. So how do we know if we're walking in humility? Because obviously false humility won't work because it's in itself it's pride. If I just pretended to be humble, God knows my heart and he knows that I'm already sinning. Well, Jesus showed us as he lived and we're still in his life. Humility is revealed in how we treat each other as human beings. Jesus proved this and people were just shocked, especially the prideful Pharisees, right? They were like, what is this? In their pride, they said that. John 13, 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In a day immersed in pride, I think we've forgotten how to wash each other's feet. In, 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 a, in a day and an age, which it's not just this age, it's, it's been this way for a very long time, we've forgotten to do what Jesus taught us to do because our pride got in the way. And ladies and gentlemen, we have to return. We have to return with that sense of urgency that we talked about earlier to the attitude that it expresses. I'm not saying we're going to wash each other's feet. Don't worry. I don't have a, a tub up here. I'm not down with that. I'm just telling you. But it's all about the heart and the attitude. So Philippians 2.3 gives us a, a picture of this. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Okay, let me go back up there. It says you probably should. You should try to. No, it says, it says you must. We must have the same attitude Jesus had, was born into. We have to be born in that and then walk in that and serve other people from the humility that the Lord gave you, that he, he gave you that nature. That's why you were reborn in the first place. That's, that's humility no matter how, how, how much they've wronged you. It, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. No matter what they've said, Jesus calls us to do no less than what he's already done for us and to us. And now he wants to do that through us. And it's all centered around this humility. When we refuse to see other people as better than ourselves, we are just fooling ourselves. We're, it's self-deception. We're, we're, we're fooling ourselves into thinking that, that we're humble. When, when we think we're better than other people. Ha have you tried it? Have you tried to think of other people as better than yourself? Do you know that it's possible? It's the Spirit of God. I am literally doing it right now. Mike, I just saw you as better than myself. I'm, I'm serious. Drew, Ron, Jim, Tori, it's happening. It just happened. 
Now, I can't attribute it to me. It's got to be the Spirit of God because in my nature, I'm, I'm fleshly. I want, you know, I want, we all do. We all want that. But this is the gift that he's given us. If we don't, this is what happens. Pride, if we, if we don't humble ourselves, and it's, it's a great work because he has to help us, of course, but it keeps us in bondage. And keep in mind, we're still Christians, right? We're still professing and all that. And the bondage is, is complacency. The bondage is, 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 is discontent. You're never satisfied. There's always, you, you just, it, not, not a good discontent where you want more of God. I'm talking about the other one. It leads to that self-deception. De- it infects our hearts. It breeds bitterness towards other people. It's the root of everything. And, and that disease just spreads through our hearts and our thought processes and our perceptions when we refuse to humble ourselves and serve the least of these. Eventually, it becomes the disease that Jesus really hit heavy on, if you notice in his ministry on earth, The disease of denying Christ while still calling him Lord. And parenthetical, that's the Pharisees. Look at how, look at all he corrected with the Pharisees. Look, read his interactions with the Pharisees. It's all dealing with pride while he himself is walking in humility. When he had every right to say, I'm uh, I'm God, hello, I'm supreme. I've been there before I was even born, so what's up? I can just, you know, I can smite you right now. No, no. He's washing their feet. I can't even do that because it's gross to me. <laughs> now, many today are, are because of pride, and this is the, just bear with me. So many today are critical of the church. Critical of the church. They're critical of leaders. We live in such a time, such a time where it seems like there's another big moral failure with, with leadership and all this, and I, I, I get it. It's hard to trust anything nowadays. We become distrustful of each other, right? We, we perceive things, so become critical. We have a loss of passion and drive, and it, 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 it's all going back to, to the pride that, that's been there for so long. Even holding on to the past will oppose humility in us if we continue to hold on to the past. It will oppose humility, and and if we're not willing to change, which means repent, well, I guess that means we're not willing to die. And that's what the humble child Christ did after he was born, and he lived on earth. It's the third point today. It's death. It's death. Because Jesus was humble in his birth, in his life, and his death. Philippians 2, 7, when he appeared in human form, he humbled, he humbled himself in obedience to God. And he died a criminal's death on the cross. died a criminal. He calls us to humbly die as well. And that is to die to our pride every day, dying to having our own way, dying to having control. No, it's not just a few people who are control freaks. I, I hear that a lot. It's, it's humanity. We like control of our lives. That's why the, 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 the whole thing of, of becoming a child again is, is, is incredible and that Jesus became a child. We have to die to needing to have position and power because the position that we need as new creations in Christ is at his feet, like totally at his feet, in humility, And dying like this, it's hard. It takes humility because it hurts. Dying hurts. We were talking about it this morning. I don't, I don't want to die. 
Yes, I know I'm going to heaven. I don't want to go through the pain. I mean, I already had 10 overdoses and had suicide attempts. I don't, I don't want to, that it's painful to other people. I don't want to do funerals. Death just stinks. <laughs> Dying like this takes humility because the pain in it, it here's the pain, it's, it's hard because we're humans. You have to face your own heart and you have to deal with what's in here and you have to give up your own way and you have to abandon that thing that was making you whole, whether it's holding on to the past, bitterness, you keep holding that person to their sins and condemnation, you hold on to that addiction, whatever it is that's completing you, and you abandon it, and it, it is hard. You go through withdrawal symptoms. It's worse, it's worse spiritually going through this kind of withdrawal than fentanyl withdrawal. And probably barely anyone in here has gone through that. It's hard. Because you just, you basically want to die. But you're going, it's a painful process, and we like to avoid pain, but we have to die to ourselves. Because if we don't, it will keep us in bondage to pride. Luke 9, 23, then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it, but if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Do you see it? The whole essence of redemption is written out from his humble birth to his humble life to his humble death. All of it was humble. And our lives are saved through humility, which means we're dependent and we're submissive to the Father at, at, at all times. So if his death was humble, and if our death to ourself has to be humble, what, what happened after his death? He was exalted. Jesus emptied himself, and here he is exalted. He's not empty anymore, so do you see it? Humility teaches us what fullness is. The world teaches us, fill yourselves with all the rewards and everything you could want. So the only way to be full, ladies and gentlemen, is to empty yourself. And then Jesus gives you living water. And you can't give yourself that living water. This isn't living water. This is hive water. <laughs> it's okay. I prefer Aquafina. But I've humbled myself this morning. We had an evangelist in Texas, and the guy always required Aquafina water at like, 68 degrees, so not judging, but doesn't seem so humble to me. Um, Jesus, he gives us living water, and w when you pour water into a glass, it fills the lowest places first. When you pour water into a glass, it fills the lowest places first. So Jesus cannot fill people who are full of themselves. He can't fill the high places in your heart. That's why back in the OT, the kings needed to tear down these high places. Those were places of pride because they competed with God. And we set up those places in our hearts in those areas that we have pride in. So we need to empty ourselves in humility, now, now, I don't, it, we, we want to wait and like, let's, let's pray about it this week and see, should we humble ourselves? No, let's like do it now. And ask him for help. And then go back to the start of, it's really, this is Christmas. Christmas is humility, what Jesus did because he became a child. And when he became a child, he knew this but he was actually illustrating in a real-life illustration of what he would later teach when he grew up. Matthew 18, 3, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what he said. So whoever, therefore, he says, whoever humbles himself 
like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Back then in ancient times, unlike our day, hard for us to relate or understand, but children had no status at all. Low zero. And the disciples before this, what they were arguing over, who would be the greatest? So pride. It's all pride. So he said essentially, become of zero status where you're nothing. I mean nothing. Because the kingdom cannot be gained by defeating an opponent or personal accomplishment. It's not going to happen. We have to become humble like children, powerless over our circumstances. Completely dependent on God to provide for us and protect us. Children, infants for sure, those of you who have infants, you know, they know they're dependent. And they're, they're not even thinking about power or achievement yet. All they know is, I need mama. I need daddy. I need to be fed. So Jesus remembered this. When Jesus said this to his disciples, become like a child, Jesus is like, I, I've, I've done it before. I've actually done it. I became a child. I know what it's like to be completely dependent, and I'm God. That's what he said. God humbly became a child, and then, and he came from heaven, right? And then he enters heaven again. It's amazing to teach us how to enter the kingdom and the key to greatness in this life, the key to all you desire before thankfulness, before anything else, for blessing, for whatever you are seeking according to his will, the key to it is found in humility and it's found in Jesus' name, which is his nature. That's the only way to find it. Becoming less is the only way to becoming more than we can imagine. It's all about his glory. We're going to focus on his glory this morning. Would you stand? Come on. Now, kind of a message, I feel like kneeling, right? But this is what's going to happen in our hearts. The song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, comes from these very verses. In 1868, a priest visited Bethlehem, and he wrote these words, with all of this in mind, all of God being born in flesh, Jesus coming down as a baby, and... On a quiet night in a little town, a humble child was born. And the song talks about meek souls, humble souls who are going to be able to receive him. Because that's how we receive him. Realizing we're nothing without him. And then his humble nature is going to be born in us. So today you can receive that. You can receive him. And you can humble yourself like Jesus. That's what this song is about. That's what don't let the Christmas nostalgia fool you with these songs. Because a lot of these songs, most of them, there is so much theology in there. Because these are men and women who wrote them, who humbled their, themselves before their master. And they wanted to celebrate the essence of Christmas, which is the incarnation, which is the humble Christ. So this morning, as, as, as Bethany sings, would you acknowledge the words and reflect on this in your heart and humble yourself in the depths of your heart? Let's sing together.
you Lord did you catch it did you catch it coming off of the message from the theology to the song and that's really why it feels so um, mysterious or uh, it's, it's all inspiring because Jesus came to be with us born in a little town, born in the most humblest way to teach us how to be humble. This Christmas, folks, many of you are traveling, many of you are staying here. Think about his message and think about how you can live your life in this way. It's what he calls us to. It's, it's the key to experiencing life beyond measure if you'll humble yourself. See those family members who you have issues with as better than yourself. See your neighbors better than yourself. See each other, please, in the church most of all, as better than yourself. And if we humble ourselves, we'll see Jesus this Christmas more than probably we ever have before. Father, thank you.